Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. Last week I reviewed Beetlejuice, which is my all-time favorite Tim Burton film, yeah, with Michael Keaton playing the ghost with the most himself. <laughs> I actually had a wonderful time doing the review, even though I had to take my time and effort to do a lot of editing, because I do a lot of editing on all my movie reviews. So you know how it is. It's really hard. <laughs> Uh, but now, I'm going to review what else, another Tim Burton film, but this time it's an adaptation, a musical adaptation that came out on December 21st, 2007. Yeah, it was very well known for its time. It's a horror musical, Sweeney Todd, The Demon Barber of Fleet Street, with Johnny Depp playing the role of a man who was once in love, wants up being sent to prison for labor, and then suddenly came back to Fleet Street to get his revenge under a new identity, where he takes his famous um, razor blade and he gets to slit their throats or even stab them in the neck you know, while they start performing a nice close shave. <laughs> Uh, he even creates his mechanical chair so that way he gets to send all the victims into a trap door that he also built and it goes directly down into the cellar where his accomplice, Mrs. Lovett, who makes all of her infamous uh, savory meat pies, yeah, she takes all the victims uh, by putting them into a meat grinder so that way she can prepare herself for a nice juicy meat pie. <laughs> yeah. That's how the story goes. And I always remember Sweeney Todd when I saw the 1979 musical. Yeah, the one that had Angela Lansbury playing Mrs. Lovett. And I always enjoy it. I really loved it. Uh, I loved the, loved the story. Um, it's a tragic love story in that whole way, but it really works. And I'm into musicals too. I mean, there's never wrong with that, um, in my opinion. So I love musicals, so it really worked well. And I was really happy that Tim Burton did a good job uh, adapting it. It wasn't easy, but he did the best he could because he was the one who saw the, the Broadway production in London when he was a Cal art student. So back in 1980, so he saw it three times because he really enjoyed it, even though he's not big on the musical genre himself, so, <laughs> but nevertheless. Um, so he had the opportunity to do this, um, even though originally it was going to be directed by Sam Mendes, the same director who gave us American Beauty with Kevin Spacey, who won his second Oscar for that, and went on to do the film Jarhead with Jake Gyllenhaal. So he was going to plan on doing this while Burden was going to work on a movie called Ripley's Believe It or Not, but that fell through. So he winds up doing this instead uh, with producer Richard D. Zenock. Yeah, the late great producer who's been known for doing uh, a lot of films. He's done musicals. Uh, the most memorable of them all was The Sound of Music. Uh, that he produced, but he also produced um, um, movies like Jaws. So he's a longtime producer and a legend. So he got in touch with um, Tim Burton to work on this, and the only difficult thing that they had to go for was was having all the actors um, perform their singing voices and. This is one of the rarest times where the actors themselves did their own singing voices and <laughs> without any dubbing whatsoever. In fact, they try to mix it in too by making it as a silent film, so that's how Burton described it. Uh, it's, it's a silent film with music, <laughs> so that's interesting. Uh, I, I love that. So that way they can fit into it. I mean, because it might have been really hard for, for the actors to perform. Helen Bodeham Carter was one of the hardest for her to do because, you know, she's going around baking the meat pie. 
know, using the, the dough roller and everything, pounding the dough, trying to mix it in inside the shop where it's all roach infested. <laughs> yeah. So she, it, it was hard for her to do. And on top of that, it, it didn't bother me. It really didn't bother me at all. It really fits the performances very well. That's for sure. Um, anyway, uh, this is the Blu-ray that I picked up um, at Best Buy for only $7.99 back in 2015. It was a good deal. Um, yeah, DreamWorks released this movie. One of the rarest times that DreamWorks ever released a Tim Burton film. And I almost wish DreamWorks had continued to release more films. And now with their deal with Universal and Alblin Partners. Because this was back when they used to have a deal with Paramount after they stopped being independent. Yeah, because Steven Spielberg wanted to have a deal with it to see how this goes. Um, has all the features on the back, as you can see. Tons of good features. I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, I mean, this release alone. <laughs> This is exactly why Beetlejuice should have all these features. I don't understand. I mean, exactly. And, yes, this is what it looks like in an Eagle Box case, as usual. It's all uh, in gray. <laughs> but still. Uh, I saw this in theaters uh, when it came out. Um, it was a holiday season. Uh, I wanted to check this out. I love Sweeney Todd. I love the 1979 uh, Broadway production, which I, which aired in 1982. Um, I even I was even lucky enough to record that on TCM, Turner Classic Movie, so they had a chance. And I think they're still playing it though, so chances are you get a chance to watch that version. Uh, and I know there was a 1936 uh, adaptation too, all of which are based on a a Penny Dreffo, um story that's um, adapted by Christopher Baum. Yeah, he actually did that. So that's how we get out all these adaptations. And I know there are times when the people said that there might be like a real life Sweeney Todd everywhere that's been around or somewhere. But this was a fictionalized character and that's all it puts it. <laughs> okay. Well, let's get to the review. It stars Johnny Depp. Helen Butterham Carter, Alan Rickman, you know, the late great Alan Rickman, who's been known for doing Die Hard and Harry Potter, several others in his career, even Dogma. I really miss him. He was a good actor. Timothy Spall, who was in Enchanted that same year. <laughs> Another musical. <laughs> yeah. But he's also in a lot of films. He's been doing them for years. Uh, Jay Weisner, uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, yes, from Borat, or, and the Ali G Show, he's been known for that, and he's also in movies like uh, Talladega Nights, The Ballad of Ricky Bobby, uh, as well as uh, <laughs> Madagascar, <laughs> I, I love the actor and, and comedian, uh, Laura Michelle Kelly, uh, Jamie Campbell Bower, no relation to Microwave Hour. <laughs> no, this is a British actor. And Ed Sanders. Yeah. It's written by John Logan, which um, is based on the play, the Broadway musical by Stephen Sondheim, who provided the music. And I be believe he did the score as well. Because, um, yeah, this is one of the rarest times where Tim Burton didn't use uh, Danny Elfman to do the score, but that would have been interesting. So Stephen Sonnenheim did the music. And it's directed by Tim Burton. The movie begins when we meet a barber named Benjamin Barker, who is played by Johnny Depp, who arrives in London in 1846 by a young sailor named Anthony Hope, who's played by Jamie Campbell Bower. Fifteen years earlier, he was falsely convicted and exiled by a corrupt judge named Turpin, who's played by Alan Rickman, who lusted after Barker's wife, Lucy. So Barker suddenly 
creates a new identity by the name of Sweeney Todd and returns to his old Fleet Street shop that's being suited by Mrs. Nellie Lovett's uh, meat pie shop and she's played by Helen Bodenham Carter which is not doing very well she basically sells a lot of meat pies that she cook <laughs> with her own hands it was infested with roaches around so at this rate she makes the worst pies in London <laughs> yeah well anyway yeah, Todd was just uh, trying out one pie and starts to spit it out because yeah, there was something inside the pie. Yeah, it's, it's disgusting, but it could be tasty. Well, anyway, Lovett tells uh, Todd that, um, that Turpin actually raped Lucy, who then poisoned herself with arsenic. So, apparently... She died. So the couple's daughter, Joanna, is now with Turpin's uh, ward. So that's how Todd vows his revenge on him by reopening his own barber shop that he had for a very long time. Um, but Mrs. Lovett suddenly loves him. So they were actually planning on being able to move uh, to a new town at the seaside so that way they'll get married that's what she was thinking about uh, later on anyway he also presents himself by bringing in his old uh, razor sharp uh, blades that he collects yeah, and this is where he uses it to, to shave all the, the customers yeah, so how about the shave <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, Turpin also has uh, an assistant who's his henchman named Beetle Banford, who's played by Timothy Spall. Which Anthony got caught um, by Turpin and, and Beetle just after he uh, suddenly spotted uh, Joanna, who's played by uh, Jay Weisner. Todd suddenly denounced a, an Italian barber named Adolfo Pirelli, who is played by Sasha Baron Cohen, who has a hair tonic that's considered as a fraud. Yeah, like it smells like piss. Um, <clears throat> he has an assistant named Toby, who is played by Ed Sanders. Even though he was humiliated to him, he decided to provide a public shaving contest that's being judged by Banford. So apparently, Sweetie Todd won the contest. Yeah, because he was very fast. You know, he was just taking some slow times and you know, trying to get the razor uh, sharper. So that way he'll be able to shave the customer. Wow. <laughs> well, Pirelli is just uh, taking his time, <laughs> you know, shaving the the customer but yeah while he's doing his falsetto <laughs> tune and then singing well this is a musical by the way <laughs> so a few days later Pirelli arrives at his shop uh, with his assistant Toby and he basically identified himself as Todd's former assistant Davy Collins and this is where Todd begins to find the secret and just knocks him out uh, with a teapot knocks him out and actually smashes him violently so he finally uh, puts him inside the, the trunk yes and afterwards uh, he takes the razor blade and sl slit his throat completely where all the blood started to splatter around, started to spray everywhere. So he puts him back into the trunk. Yeah. So that's when uh, Lovett suddenly found out because he had blood on his shirt. <laughs> well, on his uh, sleeve. 
<laughs> okay. Um, meanwhile, Bamper suddenly uh, had to receive an advice to Turpin because Turpin was ready to have um, himself groomed because he needed a shave. I mean, he's already growing a, a beard. But he was also attending to marrying uh, Joanna. So Todd suddenly shaves Turpin, preparing to slit his throat. That's what he was planning on. But he was being interrupted by Anthony, which he was planning to elope with Joanna before Turpin suddenly noticed it. And this is what happens. I mean, Turpin leaves, totally angry, and Todd just continues to his entire revenge that hoping that if Turpin arrives back again he'll be able to have his chance to finally kill him which did at the end <laughs> so as it continues um, yeah, Todd started to uh, hire a lot of customers around just so they can have a close shave but he winds up stabbing and slitting their throats he actually created a, a mechanical chair from scratch and he's taking all the parts, adding all the, the tools and, and all the adjustments that he had to do and that's how he created it so that way he'll be able to move backwards so, because he also created a trap door too so this will work and he can go all the way straight down into the cellar where Lovett creates all of her meat pies. You know, she has a meat grinder that she could put uh, all the victims inside and and put all the meat pies inside uh, the oven. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> and since then, um, she became very successful. She started selling tons of meat pies to all the customers around. Um, even though we, we suddenly spotted, um, which we also spotted earlier too, a, um, a bigger woman who, who won't go away. But she's there because, well, she needed some more money. And that's why she does this. Um, so things were going so well, you know, for, for both Sweeney Todd and, and Nellie Lovett. And the fact that now t Toby becomes uh, Lovett's assistant so even though yeah he was drinking gin and all that <laughs> so. so yes uh, Lovett's plan was um, she wanted to get married to, to Todd and and move to the seaside so to get married and have a wonderful life even with Toby uh, that's what her plan was so that this will be their dream come true. Um, well, this is where I'm going to spoil the surprise here. Sad to say, but if you haven't seen the movie or the play or any other, yeah, the Broadway musical, well, you're in for it. <laughs> well, things started to get worse too when Bampert arrives at the pie shop, informing the love it that. The neighbors have been complaining about the stink uh, from her, her chimney. So Todd suddenly distracts him by offering him free grooming. Because he really needs some. <laughs> and this is where he slits his throat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where his body suddenly falls all the way down into the pit. Like all the other victims were. <laughs> yeah, I'm almost smashing their brains. Well, Anthony found out that Joanna is being sent to a mental institution. So he decided to disguise himself as a wig maker's apprentice to rescue her. And he did. And yes, and when he finally uh, found her, that's when all the the blondes started to attack the the guard. <laughs> and then suddenly Turpin arrived and he begins to find out what happened. So now he, he begins to have a close shave and 
Yeah, this is exactly where he finally gets his revenge on him, and he finally stabs him and slits his throat and went all the way down <laughs> to the pit. <laughs> so now he's dead. Even though, yes, he did find out that the bigger woman came by and actually slit her throat and dumped him down there as well. And until he, he begins to find out that the bigger woman is, believe it or not, is his wife the whole fucking time. While Toby suddenly found out while he was stuck inside the cellar, he was locked in just to be safe. He was uh, working on the meat grinder because uh, yeah, Lubbock told him to do that. And, to create all these pies and send them there and by the time he, he took out one meat pie that was already made this is when he, eat, he ate one and then he begins to spit out something that came in his mouth and he found out there was a, a finger inside so he was afraid and, and he decided to run away by the time um, Todd came by and he was looking for him along with Lovitz yeah, things just seems to happen so fast. Well, Anthony had brought in the, uh, Joanna to, to stay inside Todd's uh, barber shop, and while well, Joanna and Anthony decided to come back because he wanted to see what's going on here. So he so he wants uh, Joanna to stay here, but Joanna suddenly hides inside the trunk until Todd suddenly uh, spotted her. Well, he thought it was a man, but <laughs> he was going to give uh, him or her a shave. <laughs> yeah, even though he has blood over his face. He says, forgive my face. Yeah. But by the end, um, when Todd suddenly found out about it, uh, this is where his plan was to kill uh, Lovett by actually sending her into the oven and she was burned completely really totally fucked up and then by the end you know grabbed his dead wife and then Toby appears takes the razor blade and slit his throat and then the movie ends kind of abrupt though uh, an abrupt ending because I was expecting to see what happens next with uh, um, Anthony and Joanna, because they were supposed to escape together, and we begin to see what happens uh, to them when they finally go straight to where they've been wanted to go. So that way they could be free from all the nightmares that, that they've been having. Yeah. And Toby, of course, you know, running away, maybe trying to find out by the townspeople that yes, he did kill Sweeney Todd. That's and Lovett's also dead too. So there we go. Um, I know, I mean, if you watch the play, you, you'll, you'll understand. But in the movie, they, they end it differently. So that, that was my nitpick. But that's okay. <laughs> but now back to unspoiling it. This was a wonderful adaptation. Uh, I thought Tim Burton did a wonderful job, in, in my opinion. And and as far as the singing voices uh, concerned by the actors, uh, Johnny Depp, uh, Hannah Bonham Carter, uh, Alan Rickman, Timothy Spall, you guessed it. Uh, I'm going to be honest, um, it didn't bother me at all. I mean, they, I thought they worked really well together, and it, it, it took a hard time for them to sing, because they had to prepare themselves to have singing lessons, uh, just to see how it fits uh, the role perfectly. I mean, with their, with uh, enough dialogue to provide. I mean, because they had a lot of dialogue, so they had to sing pretty fast, just trying to get to it. So that's how the film goes and how it flows. There's a hole in the world in the bit bat pit. There's a whole little world that's full of shit. <laughs> like I said it right. Um, but then, you know, you see Sweeney Todd with his trusty razor blade. Uh, where he just goes around to all the customers saying, You, sir! To, sir! Welcome to the grave! 
I will have my vengeance and so on. The, he has a bit of Captain Jack Sparrow right there <laughs> when he does that. But hey, <laughs> it's, it's not easy. Um, also, uh, I love the sets that they shot. I mean, this was all done at Pinewood Studios. So they were going to use uh, London for that particular set, but they wanted to make it look more, you know, as um, as Victorian as it could be, because this was set during the Victorian times, and in, in that particular era. So he wanted to make it as Victorian as it could be, to uh, mix in all the, the streets to look as real as possible, and have him see what the shop looks like and everything. Um, and the fact that it's very uh, gruesome, yeah, eerie, and and gory too, yeah, and also <laughs> very gothic-like, it really works. Um, and yes, it has a lot of violence and gore in the mix of the film, which is mostly, you know, the slitting of the throat. It's like all this blood started to splatter around, it started to spray around the, the entire screen it was amazing I mean the way they did it because they actually use a lot of uh, pressure to to mix in with the blood to put in there so and using all, all the prosthetics to mix in for the victims so they look like they've been slipped so they took a lot of work to do so um, to create that and it was amazing they I, I mean this is something I never thought I would see and I love that. Um, I know people get grossed out by by all these scenes uh, of blood and, and and of course cannibalism because that's what they put into it in the movie. You know, using all all the <laughs> the dead uh, human bodies to make those meat pies. And this is what you get. <laughs> so they didn't use animal meat at all. <laughs> so there you go. Um, and it, it's well done. I love that. I mean, there's a I, the only thing that was a mix of CGI right there was just the movements of the camera between all the streets because that's where they use those green screen shots. But the rest of them are not green screen, so they, it it feels it felt just right. That's how they went for. It. But I think the green screen effect was mostly for the sky and you know, just so they can get the image right and trying to make it look as real as possible so that's exactly what they did and they also use um, monochromatic uh, dark and grays uh, for this entire production even though they did have some luscious colors uh, for the the uh, the flashbacks you know when he was very young and he was marrying to Lucy and you see all these uh, bright colors of, of how shiny it looks and then you see all the other shots where where you begin to see like a, a sequence where as their imagination where you see uh, <laughs> you know, both uh, you know, Johnny Depp, uh, Alan Bonham Carter and and Ed Sanders you know, <laughs> you know dressed up in their bathing suits while they were at the beach and you know, having a picnic and all that and you know, they had, they'd dress all these Victorian uh, clothes that they have to wear, everything. And of course all the other dark uh, Victorian clothes that they have to wear for the film. And I love how they made those um, sharp blades that they came up with. It looks so unique. Definitely Victorian again. I keep saying the word. I'm sorry, but I'm trying to get into it. It's, it's well made. Um, it has an outstanding soundtrack that's done by Stephen Sondheim right there. So Stephen uh, Sondheim did a great job uh, adapting it, creating all the songs and you know, writing all the lyrics and all of that in the mix of this film so it works so well. I bet Angela Lansbury, uh, I don't know if Angela Lansbury had ever saw the film but I'd be surprised uh, if she did. That'd be a good criticism too. Um, it did pretty well at the box office. Um, 
not exactly a hugely success, but it did very well uh, for the holiday season. A lot of films were coming out in 2007, so it kind of made sense. I mean, we were getting to the Oscar season. Um, but it was nominated and actually won one. But, and actually the, made uh, a huge profit for uh, DVD releases. And later we got a Blu-ray release, which I just showed you. Has all the features and did so well. And I had a wonderful time watching this and still entertaining me even after all these uh, years. So. <laughs> and John Logan did a great job writing the screenplay. I mean, it took some time to write all that, even though this is the same writer who gave us Bats. <laughs> so, it's the second time he did a horror film. So it works. So, um, I highly recommend this movie. Um, so I give Sweetie Todd, the Demon Barber of Wheat Street, five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.